Hello, my name is Dr. Mondrian Contreras, and today we're going to perform one of, if not the most important, jobs of a veterinarian, which is the physical examination. The, the purpose of a physical exam is to gather information about the patient. This information, along with a complete history, is the foundation for reaching a diagnosis, as well as a guide to initiate therapy, as well as a means to evaluate treatment. The, um, a good physical exam requires knowledge of normal anatomy as well as an understanding of physiology as well as a variety of physio uh, pathophysiological states. Um, while a complete physical exam should be performed on every patient, regardless of complaint, practical consideration often dictates the amount of time and effort uh, needed for a particular organ system. Here at Carroll Street Animal Hospital, all of our patients are taken in by our technicians. Our technicians will get a weight on all of our patients as well as get a brief history uh, from the owner. They will then get vitals on all of our patients getting temperature, pulse, and respiration. At which time they will step out of the room and provide this information to the doctor, at which time we will formulate a plan. Uh, once back inside the room, uh, the veterinarian will uh, expand upon this history, uh, asking more detailed questions, uh, as well as um, evaluate our patients from a distance. Uh, we'll be getting evaluating our patients' overall demeanor, uh, their gait, uh, how they're breathing, uh, as well as their body condition. Uh, next, after all this is done, we can finally get to our physical examination. I like to approach my patients always in the same way. I start from the head and I work my way back. I will first evaluate the patient head on, as I like to evaluate symmetry of the patient as I'm palpating the head, the face, as well as the neck region. I will also be able to do an, uh, a mini neurological exam, evaluating some of our cranial nerves. I will then uh, palpate uh, the submandibular lymph nodes as well. The next thing I like to do all right, is evaluate the oral cavity. This can be very tricky in many of our patients, but it is extremely important as dental disease is one of the most common diseases we see in our patients. The first thing I like to do is I like to lift, lift up the lip and evaluate to see how moist or tacky our patient's mucous membranes are. This can give us an idea of hydration status. Next, I like to look at gum color. Uh, again, uh, hopefully our gums are nice and pink. However, uh, if our patient's gums are pale or yellow um, or blue, this can be a sign of icterus or possibly anemia. So next, I like to uh, press on the gums and evaluate uh, how quickly our gums go from light to pink. This is capillary refill time, and this can help me evaluate how well our evaluate perfusion as well as how our patients are oxygenating their blood. Uh, next, I like to uh, look at our patient's teeth and get a and get an idea of what our patient's dental grade is. Uh, again, as I'm evaluating the teeth, I'm going to show the owners, all right, um, which can again strike up a conversation the importance of dental care and how proper dental care has been shown not only to extend the life of our patients, all right, but also uh, to improve the quality of life. Next, if our patient is really good, we can evaluate uh, other structures in the mouth. Again, we're able to open up the mouth and look at other structures in, the, uh, in like the tongue or underneath the tongue, as well as the hard palate and the tonsils. So next we're going to look at the eyes and we're going to perform an ophthalmic examination. Uh, again, I like to evaluate the structures around the eyes first. Again, looking at and underneath uh, both the upper and lower eyelids. Again, evaluating for any abnormal hair growth or uh, again evaluating any anatomical abnormalities that could cause a problem in the future or that could be corrected before a problem occurs. Uh, next, I like to uh, use uh, our uh, ophthalmoscope. Again, this device helps me to evaluate structures inside the eye. Uh, again, I like to again start all the way in the back of the eye first evaluating both the, the retina, the optic nerve, as well as the blood vessels, and then work my way forward. Again, evaluating the posterior chamber, uh, the uh, lens, the iris, the anterior chamber, and then the cornea. Again, as I'm evaluating the eye with my ophthalmoscope, I'm also able to look at pupillary size and thus do another neurological examination. Uh, as I'm evaluating the pupillary light reflex, both direct and indirect, I'm able to uh, evaluate the integrity of the optic nerve, the retina, the ocular motor nerve, the midbrain, as well as the iris sphincter muscles. Uh, next, we're going to evaluate uh, the ears. The ears are really just an extension uh, of our skin. 
Again, the first thing I like to do is I like to get a good feel uh, of our patient's ears, feeling for any kind of chronic changes. I also like to look inside the ears, all right, looking for any type of debris. Uh, next, I'm going to use my uh, otoscope. All right. Uh, again, the first thing I like to do is I like to lift up on the base, the base of the ear. All right. This helps me to straighten out both the horizontal and vertical canals. And this otoscope allows me to evaluate both of those structures as well as get a good visualization of the tympanic membrane. Again, as you can imagine, this can be very difficult in many of our patients. However, this should always be attempted. Again, ear disease or otitis is extremely common in our patients and performing a proper ear exam uh, as well as cytology is necessary um, for making a diagnosis of otitis as well as evaluating response to therapy. Next we're going to go from the ears uh, to the chest and we're going to evaluate the heart and the lungs. Again, I've already gotten a good history from the owners uh, which maybe suggest any kind of cardiopulmonary disease. Or, and I've also evaluated my patient from a distance, evaluating how our patient has been breathing. Before I put my stethoscope on the, on the chest, I always have my technician hold the mouth and have our patients breathe through the nose. Again, this helps me hear the heart a little bit easier. As I'm listening to the heart, again, you'll see me place my stethoscope on various portions of the chest. This helps me to evaluate different valves of the heart, the aortic, the pulmonic, as well as the mitral, and then the tricuspid on the other side. Again, as I'm, as I'm listening to the heart, you'll also see my hand being placed on the femoral pulse. Again, as I'm listening to the heart and feeling the pulse, I'm making sure that they are strong and synchronous pulses. As I'm listening to the heart, I'm noting any kind of abnormal rhythm, all right, and noting obviously any kind of arrhythmia. And thus, I'm also listening for any type of murmur, which can be a sign of structural change of the heart. Uh, from the heart next, I'm going to listen to the lungs. I will tell my technician to stop holding the mouth as again our patients may breathe a little bit deeper making it more easy, making it easier uh, to evaluate the lungs. As I'm listening to the lungs you will again see me place my stethoscope on different parts of the chest. Again this helps me um, to listen to all lung fields. Sometimes you'll also see me place the stethoscope on the trachea. Again this helps me to differentiate between upper and lower airway sounds. All right, so next, from the chest, we move back to the abdomen, and we perform an abdominal palpation, or I like to call this the belly massage, where we're going to be able to evaluate um, some of our organs. I like to start first at the front or the rostral part of our abdomen, where I push up underneath the ribs, evaluating a portion of the liver. Next, I move in the dog to the left, or to the caudal pole of the left kidney. Uh, in kitty cats, we can fill both kidneys completely, all right, getting size and shape. Uh, this can be extremely important, especially in our uh, kidney failure, kitty cats. Next, I will feel the spleen, and then as I'm palpating, I'm, I'm feeling our intestines throughout until I get to the finish with the bladder. Again, as I'm palpating the abdomen, again, I'm evaluating our patient and seeing if there's any kind of pain or discomfort. I'm also noting any type of abdominal masses. Next, we're going to move to the biggest organ in our patient's body, which is the skin. As I'm looking at the skin, I'm also feeling our patient's uh, coat, all right, and feeling the texture, which can give us a clue about nutritional status. I'm also looking for any primary or secondary skin lesions, such as crusts, scales, uh, hair loss, all right, and then I'm also, as I'm feeling the skin, I'm also feeling for any kind of lumps or bumps, and I'm making sure I'm palpating all lymph nodes. As I'm evaluating the skin, I'm also able to do an orthopedic exam and I'm able to evaluate muscle symmetry uh, throughout the body. I am also able uh, to feel all joints, again, palpating for any kind of swelling or pain and discomfort. Again, as I start working my way back, I'm able to feel our patient's kneecaps. Again, I can see if they move in and out. Again, medial patellar luxations or patellar luxations, again, are common, uh, a little or more common in our smaller breed dogs. Uh, and then finally, as I get to the end, I'm also able to evaluate the urogenital system. All right, uh, and, and our male intact dogs, again, a rectal exam will be uh, important to evaluate the prostate. Uh, and then our intact females, again, a lot of times you want to evaluate the vulva for any signs uh, of being in heat. 
again, and depending on our patient's signalment, okay, um, will indicate a lot of times uh, and what they're coming in for will give us a clue as to what we uh, what we need to do in our physical exam. Again, sometimes we need to do more flexion and extension uh, of our limbs or do more of a neurological exam. In conclusion, I hope this helps you understand everything that a physical examination entails. I also hope this helps you stress the importance of having this performed on our animals every year. Our patients age quickly and thus subtle changes can be missed. Again, I hope this information was helpful. Thank you for your time.